Welcome to 2024 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Welcome to lesson number 13, ready for teaching on March 30. It's titled, Wait on the Lord, and is from the Sabbath School Lesson Series on Psalms, authored by Dr. Dragoslava Sandrak and read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, March 23. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we've been waiting on you for so long reading these psalms. We've been encouraged by what is written in your word and what has been written in the lesson. And as we open your word this week, we pray that we may continue to be blessed wherever we're reading, Lord, whether we're reading in Africa or the Middle East or in Asia or in North or South America or in Europe or in Australia or New Zealand or the islands of the sea, Lord, wherever we are, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us as we open your word. And today I'd particularly like to pray for Odette Lynch and for those listening in Nagaland in India and for Claudio Frexis Jr. in Eureka in California and Kanisha Reed, who's also in the United States, and Lloyd Beckford and Zola Green and Dennis Carby and Verna Johnson, all from Jamaica, and Gladys in Kenya. Lord, each of us has our own needs. Each of us needs to be able to know that not only do you care for us, but you show that care to us as well. And so as we open your word, we pray for your blessing. May your Holy Spirit guide us, we pray, in this last lesson in this series on the book of Psalms. In Jesus' name, amen. Our memory text this week is Psalm 27 and verse 17. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. That's Psalm 27, verse 14. Let's read it again. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. We have reached the last week in this quarter study of the Psalms. The spiritual journey has taken us through the experience of awe before the majestic Creator, King and Judge, through the joys of divine deliverance, forgiveness and salvation, through moments of surrender in grief and lament, and through the glorious promises of God's everlasting presence and the anticipation of the unending universal worship of God. The journey continues, though, as we live in the hope of the Lord's coming when our longing for God will find its ultimate fulfilment. If there is a final word that we can draw from the Psalms, it should be, wait on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord is not an idle and desperate biding of one's time. Instead, waiting on the Lord is an act full of trust and faith, a trust and faith revealed in action. Waiting on the Lord transforms our gloomy evenings with the expectancy of the bright morning, as we read in Psalm 30, verse 5, For his anger is but for a moment, his favour is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And Psalm 143 and verse 8, Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. It strengthens our hearts with renewed hope and peace. It motivates us to work harder, bringing in the sheaves of plentiful harvest from the Lord's mission fields, as we read in Psalm 126 and verse 6, He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And we also look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 to 38. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. 
Waiting on the Lord will never put us to shame, but will be richly rewarded because the Lord is faithful to all his promises. As you read in Psalm 37, verses 7 to 11, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of of peace. And then verse 18, the Lord knows the days of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever. And then verse 34, wait on the Lord and keep his way and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. And Psalm 71 and verse 1, in you, O Lord, I put my trust, let me never be put to shame. And Psalm 119, verse 137 and 138. Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Your testimonies, which you have commanded, are righteous and very faithful. Sunday, March 24. The Call of Waiting Read Psalm 27, verse 14, 37, verses 7, 9 and 34, 39, verse 7, 40, verse 1, 69, verse 6, Galatians 5, 5 and Romans 8, 18 to 25. What do these texts implore God's people to do? First of all, Psalm 27, verse 14, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And Psalm 37, verse 7, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Verse 9, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. And verse 34, wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. And then we read Psalm 39 verse 7, And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. And Psalm 40 verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. And Psalm 69 verse 6, Let not those who wait for you, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel. And Galatians 5 verse 5, For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And Romans 8 verses 18 to 25, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labours with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance." Perhaps one of the greatest struggles in life is the stress of waiting. 
no matter who we are, where we live, what our situation in life is, we all at times must wait for things. From waiting in line in a store to waiting to hear a medical prognosis, we wait, which we don't always like doing, do we? What then about waiting for God? The notion of waiting on the Lord is found not only in the Psalms, but abounds all through the Bible. The operative word in all this is perseverance. Perseverance is our supreme commitment of refusing to succumb to fear of disappointment that somehow God will not come through for us. God's devoted child waits, knowing with certainty that God is faithful, and those who wait on Him can trust that if we leave our situation to Him, we can be sure that He will work it out for our best, even if at the time we don't necessarily see it that way. Waiting on the Lord is more than just hanging on. It is a deep longing for God that is compared to intense thirst in a dry land, as we read in Psalm 63, verse 1, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. The psalmist waits on many blessings from God, but his yearning to be brought close to his God surpasses any other desire and need in life. As we read in Paul in this amazing passage in Romans, God and the whole creation are waiting for the renewal of the world and the blessed meeting of God and his people at the end of time. He writes in verse 19, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. What an incredible promise. Yet, while we are waiting for the ultimate salvation and reunion with God, even as it said in verse 22, the whole creation groans and labours with birth pangs, the Lord still abides with his people now through the Holy Spirit. Meanwhile, we are called to bear witness in Acts 1, 4-8 to the plan of salvation which will culminate in a new creation. Acts 1, beginning at verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That new creation, ultimately what we are waiting for, the final fulfilment of our hopes as Adventist Christians, whose very name Adventist contains the idea of the hope that we await, we wait, but we know that it's not in vain. Christ's death and resurrection at the first coming is our surety of his second coming. And so to finish today, what are some things you are waiting for now from God? How do we learn to wait in faith and in trust, especially when what we are praying for hasn't yet come? Monday, March 25, Peace of a Weaned Child. Read Psalm 131. What does this psalm teach us about our relationship with God? Psalm 131, beginning at verse 1. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. 
God's people live in a world that afflicts the faithful, a world full of temptations and hardship for almost everyone. A refreshed conviction that he is a child of God and dependent on God for his life consoles the psalmist and brings him to confess that his pride has no value. The deceitfulness of pride is that it causes the proud to become self-centred and unable to look beyond themselves. The proud are thus blinded to the higher reality of God. In contrast, the righteous lift their eyes to God, as we read in Psalm 123, verses 1 and 2, Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, until he has mercy on us. The acknowledgement of God's greatness makes them humble and free from self-seeking and vain ambition. The psalmist confesses that he does not seek great matters and things too high in Psalm 131 verse 1. These expressions describe God's works in the world that are beyond human comprehension. Modern science has shown us that even the simplest things can be incredibly complicated and far beyond our understanding, at least for now. In fact, there's a great irony. The more we learn about the physical world, the greater the mysteries that appear before us. Meanwhile, the metaphor in Psalm 131 too, like a weaned child with its mother, is a powerful image of one who finds calmness and who is quieted in the embrace of God. It points to the loving relationship a child has with its mother at various stages in that child's young life. Through weaning us from insubstantial ambitions and pride, God introduces us to the nourishment of solid food, which is to, as it says in John 4.34, do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. We're also referred here to Hebrews chapter 5 and verses 12 to 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil." The childlike trust depicted in Psalm 131 is mature faith that has been tried and tested by the hardships of life and has found God to be faithful and true to his word. The psalmist's attention at the end rests on the well-being of God's people. Ultimately, we are called to use our experience with God to strengthen his church, that is, From what we have learned personally of God's faithfulness and goodness, we can share with others who, for whatever reason, still struggle with their faith. Our witness about Christ can even be within the church itself, where many need to know him for themselves. And so to finish the day, Matthew 18 verse 3 reads, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. What is Jesus saying to us here? What does this idea entail? Tuesday, March 26, Bringing in the Sheaves Read Psalm 126. What gives strength and hope to God's people? What is being said here, in this context, that we can apply to our own lives today? Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. 
Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. The Lord's miraculous deliverances in the past are an inexhaustible source of inspiration for God's people and their source of hope for the future. The past deliverance was so great that it could be described as a dream-come-true experience, as you read in Isaiah 29, verses 7 and 8. The multitude of all the nations who fight against Ariel, even all who fight against her and her fortress and distress her, shall be as a dream of a night vision. It shall even be as when a hungry man dreams, and look, he eats, but he awakes, and his soul is still empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreams, and look, he drinks, but he awakes, and indeed he is faint, and his soul still craves. So the multitude of all the nations shall be who fight against Mount Zion. Notice that the generation that praises the Lord in Psalm 126 for his past deliverance of his people from captivity in verse 1 is presently in captivity, as we saw in verse 4. Yet the past joy and relief are relived through songs and appropriated in present experiences. The new generations keep biblical history alive by counting themselves as present among those who saw the events firsthand. Thus, a living faith cherishes God's great deeds for his people in the past as something that the Lord has done for us and not simply things that the Lord did only for them, the past generations of believers. In fact, the memory of the past spurs renewed hope for the present. The image of the streams in the south in verse 4 of Psalm 126 is a powerful metaphor of God's acting suddenly and powerfully on behalf of his people. The very south of Judah was an arid desert region. The streams were formed suddenly and filled with rushing water after heavy rainfalls during the rainy season. The early and late rains played a crucial role in the success of the agricultural year. As you read in Deuteronomy 11.14, Then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain, your new wine and your oil. And Deuteronomy 28 verse 12, The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Similarly, The image of sowing in tears and reaping in joy, as we read in Psalm 126 verses 5 and 6, is a powerful promise of divine leading from a difficult present to a happy future. The end of the harvest season was the time when the ancient Hebrew pilgrimages brought the fruits of the season to God's temple in Jerusalem, as we read in Exodus 34 verses 22 and 26. Verse 22, And you shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. And verse 26, The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. The harvest motif provided a potent spiritual lesson to the people at that time. Just as the hard labour of sowing and caring for the fields, orchards and vineyards is rewarded with the joy of plentiful harvest, so the present trials of God's people will be crowned with the joy of salvation at the end of time. The image of the great harvest points to God's restoration of his kingdom on earth at Christ's second coming. As you read in Amos 9, verses 13 to 15, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel, 
They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. And then Matthew 9, verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Here too, however, the theme of waiting arises. As with the harvest, we must wait to see the fruit and results of our labor. And so to finish today, dwell on some times when you clearly and unmistakably saw the Lord working in your life or in the lives of others. How can you draw hope from those experiences for whatever you might be going through now? Wednesday, March 27, Waiting in God's Sabbath Rest Read Psalm 92, what two aspects of the Sabbath day are highlighted in this song for the Sabbath day. Psalm 92, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. On an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp, with harmonious sound. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. O Lord, how great are your works! Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed for ever. But you, Lord are on high forevermore. For behold your enemies, O Lord, for behold your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eye also has seen my desire on my enemies. My ears hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. The praise of God for the very works of his hands in verses 4 and 5 and the Eden-like portrayal of the righteous in verses 12 to 17 clearly point to creation, the first aspect that the Sabbath commemorates. The psalm also magnifies the Lord for his victory over enemies as the God of justice in verses 7 to 15, and so reinforces the second Sabbath theme, redemption from evil, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 to 15. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Thus Psalm 92 extols God for his past creation and present sustaining of the world. And it points to the end-time hope in eternal divine peace and order. The people can enjoy Sabbath rest because God is the Most High, we read in Psalm 92 verse 1. His superior position on the high places gives him an unparalleled advantage over their enemies. Yet, although he is the Most High, the Lord readily reaches down to rescue those who call on him. 
The Lord's work of creation, and especially redemption of that creation, should inspire people to worship God and love Him. After all, living in a fallen creation, without the hope of redemption, isn't anything to be particularly thrilled about. We love, we suffer, we die, and we do so without any hope. Hence, we praise the Lord not only as our Creator, but as our Redeemer as well. Fresh oil, in Psalm 92 verse 10, conveys the psalmist's renewed devotion to serve God as his re-consecrated servant. The anointing with oil was done for consecration of chosen people, such as priests and kings. As you read in Exodus 40 and verse 15, you shall anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may minister to me as priests, for their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. And 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? Yet the psalmist chose an unusual Hebrew word, balal, B-A-L-A-L, to describe his anointing that does not typically depict anointing of God's servants, but denotes mixing of oil with other parts of the sacrifice, as we see in Exodus 20 verse 2, and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil, you shall make them of wheat flour, and Leviticus 2 and verses 4 and 5, and If you bring as an offering a grain offering baked in the oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. But if your offering is a grain offering baked in a pan, it shall be of fine flour unleavened mixed with oil. The psalmist's unique use of balal implies that the psalmist wishes to present himself as a living sacrifice to the Lord and to consecrate his whole self to God. As you read in Romans 12 verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It is not surprising to find thoughts about consecration in a psalm that is dedicated to the Sabbath, because the Sabbath is the sign that the Lord sanctifies his people, as you read in Exodus 31 verse 13. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. The images of palm trees and cedars of Lebanon portray God's people growing in faith and true appreciation of God's wonderful purposes and love. The Sabbath is the sign of the Lord's eternal covenant with his people, as we read in Ezekiel 20, verse 20. Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Thus, the Sabbath rest is essential to God's people because it empowers them to trustingly wait upon the Lord to fulfil all his covenantal promises. And we are now referred to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 to 10. Therefore, Since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest." although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today... 
after such a long time as it had been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. And so to finish the day, read through Psalm 92 again. What great hope is offered to us there? And how can we, even right now, take comfort in what it says? Psalm 92, beginning at verse 1. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night, on an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp with harmonious sounds. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. O Lord, how great are your works! Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. But you, Lord, are on high forevermore. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eye also has seen my desire on my enemies. My ears hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Thursday, March 28. Joy comes in the morning. Read Psalm 5 verse 3. 30 verse 5, 49 verse 14, 59 verse 16, 92 verse 2, 119 verses 147, Second Peter 1, 19 and Revelation 22, 16. What time of day is symbolically portrayed as the time of divine redemption and why? First of all, Psalm 5 and verse 3, My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. And Psalm 30, verse 5, For his anger is but for a moment, his favour is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And Psalm 49, verse 14, Like sheep they are laid in the grave, death shall feed on them, the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall be consumed in the grave, far from their dwelling. And Psalm 59, verse 16, I will sing of your power, yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning, for you have been my defence and refuge in the day of my trouble. And then, Psalm 92, verse 2, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. And Psalm 119, verse 147, I rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. I hope in your word. And Second Peter 1 and verse 19, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And Revelation 22 verse 16, I, Jesus, have set my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. 
In the Psalms, morning is typically the time when God's redemption is anticipated. Morning reveals God's favour, which ends the long night of despair and trouble, as we read in Psalm 130, verses 5 and 6. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. In Psalm 143, God's deliverance will reverse the present darkness of death. In verse 3, For the enemy has persecuted my soul, he has crushed my life to the ground, he has made me dwell in darkness, like those who have been long dead. And into the light of the morning, in verse 8, Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. And verse 7, from the pit. Answer me speedily, O Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit, into residing in the land of uprightness, as it said in verse 10, teach me to do your will, for you are my God, your spirit is good, lead me in the land of uprightness. Read Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. What happened in the morning, talked about here, and why is it so important to us? Mark Chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. Now, when the Sabbath was past, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices, that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee, there you will see him, as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The resurrection morning of Jesus Christ opened the way for the eternal morning of God's salvation for all who believe in his name. Jesus' disciples experienced the full strength of the promise in Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. When they met the resurrected Lord. It is only by God's favour and unconditional love that our weeping is transformed to joy, as we read in Verses 5 and 7. For his anger is but for a moment, his favour is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And verse 7. Lord, by your favour you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. As the morning star announces the birth of a new day, so faith heralds the new reality of eternal life in God's children, as we read in 2 Peter 1 verse 19. Jesus is called the bright and morning star, we read in Revelation 22.16, whom we eagerly await to establish his kingdom, in which there will be no more night, evil and death. And we read about that in Revelation 21 verses 1 to 8. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then 
I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And then verse 25. Its gate shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. In the end, more than anything else, this is what we are waiting for when we talk about waiting on the Lord. And surely the wait is worth it. And then from the Tsar of Ages, page 785, we read, Over the rent sepulchre of Joseph, Christ had proclaimed in triumph, I am the resurrection and the life. These words could be spoken only by the deity. All created beings live by the will and power of God. They are dependent recipients of the life of God. From the highest seraph, To the humblest animate being, all are replenished from the source of life. Only he who is one with God could say, I have power to lay down my life, and I have power to take it again. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. End of quote. And so to finish the day, death, as it has been said, has been etched in our cells at birth. Though true, at least for us fallen beings, what has the resurrection of Jesus promised us about the temporality of death? Why must we never forget just how temporal death is for us? Friday, March 29. Further thought. If you have the opportunity and have the book Steps to Christ, the chapter Growing Up into Christ on pages 67 to 75 is worth reading. It's my favourite little book. Let's continue with the reading of the lesson. The Psalms utter fervent appeals to wait on the Lord. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. We read in Psalm 37 verse 7. When waiting strikes us as burdensome, uncertain and lonely, we should remember the disciples on the day of Jesus' ascension to heaven. We read the description in Acts chapter 1 verses 4 to 11. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go 
into heaven. Jesus was taken up to heaven before their eyes, while they were left behind to wait for him to come back on some unknown future date. Who has ever experienced a more intense yearning to receive God's blessing now than the disciples on that day? They surely longed, Lord, take us with you now. Yet they were instructed to wait for the promise of the Father and for Jesus' return. If we think that the disciples were filled with despair and disappointment, we will be surprised. They returned to Jerusalem and did exactly what Jesus told them. They waited for the gift of the Holy Spirit and then preached the gospel to the world with power, as we read in verses 12 to 14. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. And then we read in Acts chapter 2 what happened next. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And then they were all amazed and marvelled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we heard them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, They are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams, and on my manservants and my maidservants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awful day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, 
I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about three thousand souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as any one had need." So, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Our Lord's commandment to wait on Him is an impossible one unless He has done His work in us through the Holy Spirit. No amount of human enthusiasm will ever stand up to the strain that waiting will impose upon our frail self. Only one thing will bear the strain, and that is abiding in Jesus Christ, namely a personal relationship with Him. And then from Steps to Christ, page 75, we read, Then if Christ is dwelling in our hearts, he will work in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure, Philippians 2.13. We shall work as he worked. We shall manifest the same spirit. And thus, loving him and abiding in him, we shall grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, Ephesians 4.15, end of quote. As we continue to wait on the Lord, we will find peace and contentment in the Psalms. Our prayers and songs are where God's heart and our hearts meet daily. And so to finish today, why is waiting significant in our spiritual life? Discuss the experiences of waiting of some biblical heroes of faith. How did waiting purify and strengthen their faith? Let's have a look at Romans 4, verses 19 to 22. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him 
for righteousness. And then Hebrews chapter 11. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he, being dead, still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and was not found, because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God." But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly sanctuary. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible." By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? 
for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment, They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. And question two, what is the end of our waiting? Psalm 37 verses 34 to 40. Wait on the Lord and keep his way and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. I have seen the wicked in great power, and spreading himself like a native green tree. Yet he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Indeed I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the blameless man, and observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together, the future of the wicked shall be cut off. For the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them, because they trust in him. That is, what are we promised when all things are finally resolved? What hope do we find in these texts, for instance, about the justice that has so long been missing in this life? And question three, why, as far as the dead are concerned, and as far as their own experience goes, is their waiting for Jesus almost gone? Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Is their waiting for Jesus almost done? What hope can we take from the answer? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Waldensians in Poland by Andrew McChesney Richard Jankowski couldn't get the police to leave him alone. Every time he set up a stand to sell Ellen White's The Great Controversy and other books in a Baltic resort town in Poland, the police showed up and demanded that he remove the stand and the books. Then the Polish Seventh-day Adventist Church Publishing House released a special issue of the Signs of the Times magazine, and church leaders sent copies to members of the Polish government. One government minister liked the issue so much that he wrote a letter asking towns across Poland to support its distribution. Richard took the letter and a copy of the magazine to the mayor of the resort town where he had trouble with the police. The mayor was impressed. He knew the government minister. He was my university professor, he said. Of course, you can freely distribute this magazine here. Can I get your permission in writing? Richard asked. The mayor wrote a letter and gave it to Richard. Richard took the letter and again set up his book stand on the street. He placed the signs of the Times magazine on the stand together with the great controversy and other books. Before long, the police appeared. You can't sell your books in our city, a police officer said. Look, I have a letter from the mayor, Richard said. The police officers read the letter carefully. Then they saluted. Okay, you can stay, one said. But that wasn't the end of the story. Shortly afterward, a grandmother stopped by the book stand. Someone had given her the great controversy some time earlier, and she had read it to her grandson. 
He had liked it very much, especially the portrayal of the Waldensian young people clandestinely sharing the word of God at the risk of their lives in the Middle Ages. The grandmother told Richard that her grandson wanted to be like the Waldensians. Her grandson understood that he needed to be like them, faithful to the word of God at all costs. He saw your stand and your book, The Great Controversy, she said. He said to me, Grandma, the Waldensians are in our town. So the grandmother sought out Richard to tell him about her grandson. She later joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering in 2017 that helped build a television studio for Hope Channel Poland. Richard Jankowski is the president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Poland. Join the global church in the mass promotion and distribution of the Great Controversy in 2023 and 2024. Or you can visit greatcontroversyproject.org for details or ask your pastor. These stories have been provided by the General Conference Office of the Adventist Mission, which uses Sabbath School mission offerings to spread the gospel worldwide. You can read new stories daily at adventistmission.org.